So, last time we developed the so-called transmissibility form of the problem. So, previous to that, you had worked through the finite differencing form of the diffusivity equation, and you got to ultimately a point where you had this equation. Of course, this is uh, for the implicit. So, how do I know by looking at that that that's for the implicit? Yeah, exactly. So the, the n plus ones here. So you have this equation, and uh, the coefficients in this equation are dimensionless, so that ultimately you just have the pressure terms, and so the dimensions or the this equation, each term in this equation has units of pressure. Okay, and this was the definition for the dimensionless coefficient. So then, if we simply multiply that equation. Uh, by this term, and we worked through it all. It seems like we made things more complicated, and in a way we did, but of course, those things, these, these are just coefficients, they're just constant numbers. So, um, and then we have an equation that's in cubic feet per day, which is flow, units of flow rate, right? Because we ultimately want to talk about things like how much are we going to produce, how many stock tank barrels per day are we going to produce, right? So then we just, you know, we, we, we made it more complicated by introducing all these terms. So we want to simplify it back down. So we're going to group some of those terms. And we're going to call B, or label B, uh, the, 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 which the volume accumulation. Okay, So that's how much fluid is expanded or contracted when the pressure is decreased or increased. And the transmissibility. And so when we then just sort of relabel re those constant terms, and I, s yeah, I say constant, but of course, the transmissibility does have a delta x in it, which is not necessarily constant. So far, everything we've done in this class, we've used the constant delta x. But there's nothing in the finite differencing formulas that would prevent you from varying delta x from grid block to grid, grid block. So, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, in the next upcoming weeks when we talk about uh, ways to include heterogeneity and other things. So uh, when we introduce these new constants, then we can get back down to a little bit more simpler equation and still in transmissibility form. Um, this is in the implicit version. If we write out uh, for the four block system, if we write that out, those are supposed to be constant delta x, but anyway, so one, two, three, four. If we write out what each of those equations are, notice here uh, they've included the Dirichlet boundary condition on the left, so you get the 3t here and the two times the transmissibility times the pressure on the boundary on the left that shows up in the first equation. And then a Neumann or no flow boundary on the right. Um, so therefore, you have the 1t here. And keep in mind um, that you know, if you don't understand where those come from, you should work through the algebra. Hopefully, on your homework, everyone came up with some clever way to include the boundary conditions on either the left or the right side. But these equations are for Dirichlet on the left, Neumann on the right, specifically no flow on the right. And if we write those equations in matrix form, again, notice in 3t, 1t there, and the boundary condition here, then ultimately we can arrive at this form of the equations for the implicit equations. Right? And of course, this is a matrix equation. T is for a, in one dimension, what is the structure of T? Tridiagonal, right? Um, when we uh, go to 2D, it'll be pentadiagonal. Right? So in, uh, in 1D, it's, it's triagonal. B is a diagonal matrix, 
right? So when you, whenever you add a diagonal matrix to a tridiagonal matrix, you still have a tridiagonal matrix, right? So ultimately we have to, if we just call everything here A, then we have a matrix equation that's A times P n plus one. And if we call everything here B, uh, then that's B. And the solution of that equation is A inverse B, right? And so we have to invert a matrix in the implicit equations. Right? So it's more work. Yes. Yeah. B will always be diagonal. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, yeah. And so if you look on the on the right hand side, where I shouldn't have called this B, because uh, then I have two Bs, right? So let, let's let's call this something else. How about little B? So yeah, on the right-hand side, you, you have a diagonal matrix uh, times the vector Pn. That's a real simple operation that gives you a column vector, right? And then Q is also a column vector. So on the right-hand side, you just have a column vector. And just again, to reemphasize, the units are in rates. So here are the units of every uh, so that's the T has units of length to the fourth times time over mass. Um, and if you just work through all the details, all these units, then every term you'll see works out to <coughs> units of flow rate. So length cubed over time, right? Or cubic feet per day or stock tank barrels per day. So uh, here's the, both the implicit and explicit forms in, in transmissibility form. So uh, for the explicit method, there, there is one thing I want to point out that, you know, here you see a B inverse. And I said, or we said, that in the explicit, in the explicit method, we don't have to solve a sy system of equations, right? We don't have to invert a matrix. But there you see a matrix B that's got a minus one. That's, it, uh, it's inverted. But Remember, B is a diagonal matrix. What's the inverse of a di diagonal matrix? Yeah, it's well, it's just one over all of the diagonal terms, right? So it's just the reciprocal of all the diagonals on the diagonal. So it's, you don't have to really, that inversion process is not hard. You know, you just put one over all the diagonal terms. So it's not a true inversion in the sense of solving a linear system of equations. So that's in the explicit method. Uh, in the implicit method now, here this is written a little bit differently such that this is the term, you know, A, that's actually been, so now you have to take the inverse, and this is a full matrix. All right, so how accurate are the explicit and implicit methods in space? Space? On the order of delta x squared in time? Delta T. Is one more accurate than the other in time? You'll get different answers, right? You probably saw that in your homework. You get slightly different answers. Is one more accurate than the other? In the sense that the exact solution is, anal is the analytic solution, right? Is one of them more accurate than the other? No. no. They're both of order accuracy delta T. So, in other words, I'm, s I'm, I'm pointing out when you solve both of those equations and you get different answers, you can't make a decision about which one is more accurate than the other one. But in the limit, as you decrease delta t, they'll both converge to the analytic solution. So here we have the equation for the explicit method. And we're going to multiply that by a parameter theta. Okay. And here we have the equation for the implicit method. And we're going to multiply that by a parameter 1 minus theta. So in a sense, we're taking sort of a 
weighted average, right? Whereas if theta is one half, then it's exactly the average, right? So if theta is one half, then I have one half, one half the explicit method plus one half the implicit method, right? So it's sort of a, taking an average of the two methods, okay? And if we do that and we rearrange and rearrange a little more, then we get this guy. And again, if theta is called is one half, then it's called the Crank Nicholson method. Now the Crank Nicholson, so it's sort of a it's sort of a mix between the implicit and it's an average between the implicit and explicit method, right? And if I again if I use theta equals one half, it's it's truly an average, but I could choose theta to be 0.75, and in that case it would be 75% the explicit method and 25% the implicit method, okay? Well, one thing to notice is I still, even though I have this so-called mixed method, I, ha I still have an implicit method because notice here I have a T on the left-hand side, which means that this whole thing right here, which I would call A, that whole thing right there is going to be tridiagonal and therefore I'm going to have to invert it. So even though it's a mixed method, it's, it's still implicit in that I have to solve a system of equations. So what would I gain by doing this? What do you think I would gain? Why would you ever do this? Yeah. So both the explicit and implicit methods or delta t accurate, order, order delta t accurate, and that's because the only difference between them is one we did a forward difference and one we did a uh, backward difference approximation, okay? And so both of those, the forward difference and backward difference, both have order delta t error. Um, but what the Crank-Nicholson method really is, is that it's, it's sort of a central difference. So in a central difference formulation, uh, you're actually approximating the derivative at the, the half time step. So halfway in between, um, you know, what, what you call the, you're approximating the derivative at the half time step, I guess. I don't really know how else to say it. So, um, so there, if you work through the error estimation, uh, like you did for the other one, then you'll see that this comes out uh, to order delta x, uh, delta t squared. And so the Crank-Nicholson method is second order accurate in both time and space. So you get a little bit more accuracy with that method. It, it is unconditionally stable uh, for this system of equations, yes. So here's just a um, comparison of the results compared to analytic solution. Uh, if you look at that solution, can you can you tell me anything about the boundary conditions? Like what type of boundary condition is on the left hand side? X equal to zero. Yeah, it's some kind of Neumann boundary condition, right? Because the, or it is a no flow boundary condition because the slope zero, right? And then, of course, on the on the right-hand side, uh, then you, you can see that that's a Dirichlet boundary condition. So this is a really common way to evaluate a new, the order of accuracy of a numerical method, or evaluate your implementation. So in a case where we have an analytic solution, like like this case, where we have an analytic solution. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll compute the error between the analytic and the numerical solution, okay? And specifically this is, uh, in, in math terms, this is called the, the, the L2 error. So you might see that, the L2 error. So the L2 error is really, a, L2 means, it's like a Euclidean distance. It's like a, a, the sort of average distance of the numerical solution from the exact solution. Okay, and so in practice, this is actually how you compute it. So 
It's like the, the sum of the squares of differences. Uh, of the, so you'll compute the numerical solution, and then you'll sample the analytic solution at those same points, compute the square of the differences, sum them all up, and divide by the total number of samples that you take, the total number of evaluations. And then if you do that and you plot that value for different discretizations, so uh, along the, along the um, uh, x-axis here is, is delta x. So as, you know, as we move this way, delta x is getting smaller, right? So as delta x gets smaller, which also means the number of degrees of freedom are increasing or the size of the matrix is increasing, right? So if, I'm, if I have a fixed length, and I make delta x smaller, I have more and more grid blocks. Right? So sometimes you'll also see this plotted as like number of degrees of freedom, or you know that translates to number of grid blocks. And in that case, that would increase in that direction. Okay. So uh, anyway, the point is, if these circles are the error as computed via this formula for a delta x at that value. And if you continue to plot, you know, continue to decrease delta x and plot the error along all those, and then you take and you plot that on a log log plot, okay? So that's, I guess, one thing that should be clarified is this is actually the log of delta x and this is the log of the error, okay? It, it should be clear because it's on a logarithmic scale, but if you, if you plot that, then they'll lay on a straight line. And the slope of that line will be the so-called convergence rate, which is proportional to the error, or it's, it's on the order of the error, okay? And so what did we say that the error is in, in, in space for the, the implicit method? The error in space. It's on the order of delta x squared, right? So the slope of this is then 2. So this is this is a very common. If you go and, and you know you look at papers and um, that where people are coming up with new and this is actually what I do a lot. You come up with new um, algorithms or new numerical techniques. It's almost the first thing you always do as you look at the convergent. You, you compare it to some analytic solution and you see how fast it converges to the analytic solution. Of course, the steeper the slope, the better, right? It means your error. You know, so so ideally, you know. You'd want something like that, but well, yeah. But the reality is, very few methods have that kind of convergence rates. But yeah, ultimately, the steeper the better. So it's also a way to compare different numerical techniques. A lot of times, you can you can compare multiple of these on the same plot. And if you say you had one one numerical technique that had an error like that, um, or you know something that was a little steeper. Then you could say that you know your, the the accuracy per degree of freedom is better in that technique, and so that's you know how you evaluate one versus another one. So that was for delta x. Uh, this is for delta t, and the way this was done was uh, the grid was they used a lot of lot of grid blocks to begin with. So the number of grid blocks is 5,000. So you have a fairly refined grid in space because you don't, in this way, uh, in order to look at the error in time, you don't want the spatial error to corrupt it. So you take a lot of grid blocks so that you have a really refined, accurate solution in space and then refine it in time. And again, you plot the same thing. And again, for the implicit method, uh, which should have order delta t, then you have a slope of 1. So this is a pretty common uh, thing you'll see a lot in literature. <coughs> so I'm not going to read all that, but that just summarizes sort of what we've done for the finite differencing techniques. So, um, you know, we developed the PDEs, uh, derived the finite differencing uh, methods, both implicit and explicit. The, the both methods are have the same accuracy. The explicit method is only conditionally stable. Right? That eta parameter has to be less than one half. Uh, 
Um, the implicit method is unconditionally stable but requires more work per, com per, per, per time step. We have to solve a system of equations. Uh, we can write those finite difference equations by multiplying through by a constant. We can write those in a rate form, and that's sort of what we talked about at the end of last class and today. And then just now I introduced the so-called Crank-Nicholson method, which is more accurate in time um, but requires a, a little bit more work, and it is an implicit method. Okay. Uh, 